welcome to our Biz Huddle podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Cuthbert, Creative Director at Baker Creative. Dr. Frederick Bertley is the President and Chief Executive Officer of COSI and the host of the QED with Dr. B Primetime Television Science Show. A Canadian scientist, science educator, and immunologist, he earned a doctorate in immunology from McGill University in Montreal. His postdoctorate fellowship focused on the development of a vaccine for HIV and AIDS patients. After Frederick joined COSI in 2017, COSI was twice named the number one science museum in the nation. He was named Columbus CEO Magazine CEO of the Year and received the President's Award from Merck and was among the Dell Inc. Inspire 100 World Changers. Welcome, Dr. Frederick Berkeley. I'm so excited to have you on our podcast. I'm such a science geek. <laughs> it's such an honor for both me and COSI to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. And I was, you know, I, I think it would be interesting for um, some of our viewers to understand, like, what was your journey getting here in your position? You know, it, it's funny you ask that question. You know, science museums are kind of interesting beast in that the path to being a CEO is really undescribed, right? Like if you think about a bank, you know, banks are run by people with, you know, an MBA or a finance degree. Hospitals are run by nurses or doctors, you know, at football teams are coached by men and women who either play football or, you know, what have you. But for some strange reason, science museums don't have a lot of scientists who run them, believe it or not, right? They have, uh, they have lawyers, business persons, um, political folks, absolutely educators, but there's not a lot of scientists who actually are the CEOs of science centers. So my pathway was irregular um, in that I became a scientist, that part's normal, became a scientist, worked as a scientist for a long time, but I've always loved that kind of public communication, connecting with a wider audience around science literacy and getting people to be excited, like you started off your show earlier, you know, to be excited about science. And so that kind of led me to, to tip my toe in the kind of science museum space. Um, and I did that at this cool place called the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. It's the oldest science museum in the country. It's a great place. And then after working there for a long time, COSI came coming. And like they said in The Godfather, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. I relocated to Columbus and started COSI in 2017. Well, I think it was a good choice. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'm loving this community. It's such a fantastic community here in Columbus and Central Ohio. Yes, absolutely. So being an immunologist and your knowledge about, you know, the scope of the pandemic, how were you able to use that knowledge in helping other businesses and helping COSI kind of navigate that space? You know, that, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll say three things. Thing number one is, you know, the pandemic hit, crushed the world, crushed our country around February. We, like many other people, by the time March rolled around, we closed our doors. And, um, and a lot of people don't know this, but COSI is a lot what we call earned revenue heavy. We have to be open and sell tickets to be able to pay our bills, right? I mean, it's not, you know, we're not heavily funded by external forces. We rely on ticket sales. People love to buy a ticket to come to COSI. So when we closed our doors, it wasn't a slow kind of petering of revenue. We fell off a cliff. We had, you know, we'd start our cash reserves for a couple of months and that was it. And so to your question about, well, how did my immunology background help me kind of cope through that is really interesting because most people who are not immunologists or not in the, tightly in the medical field related to infectious disease, you know, thought, oh, society will get back to normal, you know, May, June might be long, you know, by July we'll be, you know, at it again. But I knew just because of my very narrow but deep expertise in what's called basic immunopathogenesis of viral infections and the timeline for vaccine development, I knew, and we were having these conversations weekly with my board that said, I was like, look, this is not going to end anytime soon. And we have to insulate COSI and protect COSI and think of a long-term play where we may be closed for a very long time. And what does life for COSI mean during and beyond that closure? And so that's one place to answer your question where my, my immunological background became very useful because I was able to kind of crystal ball and not because I'm a 
a clairvoyant, but just because I had some expertise in this area and I knew that, wait a minute, this is not going to end soon. So that was one place it helped. The second place it helped is really getting people to understand what's happening. I think, you know, to my science co scientist colleagues out there, that's one thing that we don't always do a great job at. You know, we're scientists, we have a PhD, and we speak in a vocabulary that, you know, maybe 12 other people in the world understand, and we think that makes us smarter. And that's not great, because you alienate a lot of people. And when something serious, like a pandemic comes along, you want to be able to meet people where they are, address their fears, their concerns, their questions, with a vocabulary that makes sense to them and not make them feel like they're ignorant or silly or, or their questions are dumb questions, but to engage them. And so my combination of being an immunologist and, and with some expertise in that space and being a science communicator, I've been really um, privileged to be invited to many circles, many companies, many for-profit companies, many non-for-profit um, folks uh, throughout the um, central higher and back throughout the country, actually, that got to a point where I would go and speak to either executives or frontline workers or serving, you name it, union people, just anybody who's part of this ecosystem that was struggling to understand it. I was being invited more and more to speak to them about it, to get them to understand about the pandemic and about the vaccine and kind of how we can best hope to get out of here. So, so that was really helpful. And then the third space where it's really helpful is even my own team here, because at COSA, you know, we're a science museum. But we have, you know, a bunch of really good educators, but a lot of the rest of us work in different departments. You might be in marketing, you might be in communications, you might be in philanthropy. And so all along the way during the pandemic, I had regular sessions where I was speaking to the team and just sharing with them kind of what's happening with the pandemic, what's happening with, you know, these viral infections growing, what's happening with the treatments and what's happening with vaccines. And so even internally, and I'm really, really blessed and honored about this part of it, is I got to be a crutch, if you will, for, for the team to try to muddle through some of this. And, and I want to be clear here, it extended beyond the team because then they would go to their home to their families and share more and read more and get a better sense. And so this idea of, of trying to lead during a very challenging time, I got to tell you, for me and people like myself, because we had that little bit of expertise, that helped us be, you know, and this may sound a little um, amodest, but that helped us be a better, stronger, more effective leader through this, because we weren't swinging aimlessly, but we had some sense of what was going on. Understood. So then with your experience and knowledge, what kind of impression do you have, do you think, when you said longevity of this thing, having to deal with it for so long, and all these variants coming out. What's your opinion about that on the timing? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So, so again, not, not having a crystal ball, but here, here, here's the reality, of it, okay? We're dealing with a virus and all the virus wants to do is one thing. It's just replicate. It's not, it's not trying to make speeches. It's not trying, and it's definitely not trying to make you sick or kill you. In fact, if it makes you sick and kills you before it can replicate, it's going to die because it wouldn't be able to pass on. So all the virus wants to do is replicate. Now, what people don't understand is this whole concept of variance is a variance just a consequence of a, a consequence of something that reproduced, right? So our children are variants of us. We don't speak of it in this way, but our children are variants of us. We're variants of our parents. Now we have two or three or four or six kids, right? In the case of viruses and bacteria, they have millions and millions and millions of offspring. And specifically in the case of coronavirus, you're talking about by the time you go through an entire course of infections, should you be infected and recovered, you know, two-ish weeks or so, you've produced a hundred trillion with a T viruses. So when you do the math on mutations, which are going to happen when you have something that replicates, you're talking about many, many mutations. In fact, we've already found over 4,500 COVID, SARS, V2 um, variants. We don't talk about that. You hear Delta and you hear a few of them in the news, but we've already have several thousand. And so to the point of predicting the future, all the virus wants to do is replicate. To do that, it needs to have a host that's susceptible for it to be infected. So that means either us as humans, either we're protected because three reasons. You can see the shield behind me. We have announced Marvel, you know, a universe of superheroes. So either you're a superhero and you can manage to just not be infected, or two, you got infected through nature and you dealt with it and you recovered. Hopefully you didn't get sick and die and you recovered. Or three, you got a vaccine. Those are the three options. Four, okay, if you went to Mars. Other than that, right? And so, so getting down to the nitty gritty, 
if we don't have enough people are protected, meaning we have enough hosts in the communities and society, the virus will always stay here. And if it stays here and replicates at a high enough level, we will get a variant that is going to be worse than the Delta variant because it's a statistical probability. A lot of the variants become non-issues. They, 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 they have a mutation and they end up being useless to the virus and they die off. But every now and then you get a bad boy or bad girl variant that comes out that can infect you faster, make you sicker and kill you faster. And so the, the only way to get around that is to have what and you've heard this in the news is to have what's called herd immunity. Right. And what people need to understand is herd immunity is not everybody getting the vaccine or, or being protected by because they got infected. It's not 100 percent of people protected. It's just a high enough threshold so that the level of virus is low enough. So the vaccine's never going to eliminate coronavirus, just like the vaccine hasn't eliminated measles, just like it hasn't eliminated mumps, rubella. These things are still around, but they're around at such low levels that they don't damage populations on a wholesale like they can do with coronavirus and they would do if we don't get their show. All of this is a timeline. I'm not going to give you a timeline, but we're not out the woods. Right now we're in September. We are not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. Understood. Understood. I think we're all kind of just holding our breath, right? <laughs> Well, I mean, what's and to that point, what, what's going to happen is just like the flu, you know, we're going to get to a level of, OK, society's decided we're going to accept X percentage. Right. I mean, we don't really talk. Now we talk about it. But prior to the pandemic, no one was talking about that the flu in the United States of America kills anywhere from, you know, 20 to 50,000 people every year. We never talk about that. You go get the flu shot. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. The flu shot doesn't work that great. You know, you get the flu, you feel bad, you recover. We've, we've decided to just live with the flu. Well, that's what's going to happen with coronavirus. It's just, you know, if you ask me to predict, it's not going to be 25,000 people in, in, in the country, right? It's probably going to be more. And so where is America, where is the world happy to level set to say, okay, some of us are going to get it, most of us are going to recover, some of us are going to get it, get really sick, and then a small subset are going to get it and die, and we just got to deal with that. Understood. So on a positive note, Yep. <laughs> the QED with Dr. B television show, raising the profile of COSI, and it's very similar to Secrets of the Zoo, and expanded the audience for the Columbus Zoo. And how do you think that's going to impact COSI? Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, that's something we're really excited about. This is a genuine partnership with COSI, a science museum, and a PBS affiliate, WOSU. And to our knowledge, it's the first science museum PBS affiliate partnership in the country that put on a primetime TV show. So we're very excited about that. And the TV show topics are really about what interests people. So yes, you do the classics about climate science and vaccines, et cetera, but we also talk about artificial intelligence. Like, what is that, right? I mean, you can't escape it. If you have one of these, it's all around you all day, every day. You know, we talk about stress. What's the science behind stress? Addiction. Many of us, unfortunately, in our lives, we know somebody who's afflicted with addiction. And, you know, how do you deal with that? So we pick science topics that are relevant to everybody's everyday kind of life and activity. And then we have a really cool magazine style show where, where we interview really smart men and women from around the country, in fact, outside the country as well, to really unpack these great topics. And so for us at COSI, we think that's going to expose us to an even broader audience. People who may not physically be able to come to the building because they can watch this TV from Texas, the show from Texas or, or, or Taiwan. And so it'll hopefully expand our audience that way. But also, we hope it'll be a crutch where people see that this is a good TV show that helps break down important science stuff without ridiculing the audience, but making sure they understand it. So we're very excited about that partnership and we look forward to seeing where it goes. Is there a particular topic that's your favorite to present on the TV show? Oh, man, that's a tough one. I, I really liked artificial intelligence. First of all, I love them all. I want to be clear. And if you ask me next week, I'll probably give you a different one. But I really like the one on artificial intelligence because we really are in that age where ones and zeros, technology, you know, unless you live completely off the grid, technology really not only is it critically important into our lives, it's embedded in our lives in ways that we have no idea. And it's not about Big Brother and George Orwell. I'm not trying to scare the audience here, but just it's important to understand just how far and deep artificial intelligence has penetrated our society um, so that we can make informed decisions. You know, and, and the flip side of it is, you know, and one of the things we talk about a lot in the show is, you, you know, to cut to the chase, artificial intelligence is all about an algorithm. 
An algorithm is a way of iterating information for the computer to just think smarter and get better. Mm -hmm. And those algorithms are programmed by individuals, right? And so what gets programmed into those algorithms are biases. So what's really neat is we have in the world and in America, this diversity and equity and inclusion kind of wave hitting again, right? But then you have, you have algorithms slash artificial intelligence hitting again, and they're actually really connected because you want to make sure the people who are writing these, these algorithms, these software programs, are female, are members from the LGBTQ community, are black and brown, you know, are from the differently able communities. So those perspectives are embedded in the algorithm as well. So you can have as best universal and broad and non-discriminatory coverage. It's absolutely true. I I totally agree with you. It totally impacts my business being in marketing and branding. And I helped write a class for Capital University in emerging technology and marketing. And it is so integrated in everything. So I totally agree with you more than people realize. And it's it's actually really fascinating. <laughs> It, it really is. It yeah. really is. And again, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but it's just the more you learn about stuff, the better, the better you can make informed decisions. So the color of science highlights women, persons of color, LGBTQ scientists in the world. Yeah. How has seeing someone in this program, they identify with succeeding in a field they would like to enter someday themselves? And how do they inspire the students? Yeah, I mean, that. look, that, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. You know, I used to do this experiment years ago. Um, I stopped, but I can still do it. It'll always work. If you ask the average people out there, if you get 100 people outside and you ask them to close their eyes and imagine a scientist. And more often than not, the first person to think of is Albert Einstein. You know, and then if you ask them, okay, well, come on, think of a female scientist. Then they'll come up with Marie Curie. You know, and if it's Black History Month, and you say, think of an African scientist, then they come up with George Washington Carver, the peanut guy. Like that's the extent of our knowledge base, right? And more often than not, it's of an older white male gentleman with thick glasses, pocket protector. And we at COSI believe that science is everywhere. And more importantly, because of that, science is for everyone. So we want everyone to have an opportunity to at minimum be exposed to science. And then for those who like it or inclined by it, be excited by it and maybe see themselves as possible scientists. So the color of science is really, to, as you said, to highlight these amazing men and women and people from all diverse audiences to showcase to the world that scientists can be and look like anyone. And that's a big motivator. So for example, we interviewed, you know, Ms. Camille Schreier. Camille Schreier is the 2020 Miss America. And people are like, Frederick, why did you interview Miss America? What's she got to do about science? Well, Miss America has not one, but has two bachelor's degrees in science, and she's working on her PhD in pharmacology. And in fact, she won Miss America by doing a science experiment. Now, how amazing is that, not just for girls, but for boys growing up to see that you can be Miss America, but still be a scientist, right? So this idea that you can still be passionate about music or sports or dance, whatever, but if you like science, that's okay. You don't have to fix, fit that white lab coat you know, um, constructed that, that we tend. So, so it, it's a program that's it's gaining a lot of legs. It's 11 years old now. Um, it's been here at COSI for five years and, and the community likes it. And, and what's really cool is not just about boys and girls, but men and women too, like parents, adults need to see this and understand that, yeah, you know, you, you can be a member of the LGBT community and be an amazing scientist, but there's normally those, those things don't connect. So it's a program we're very proud of here at COSI. So who's your hero? in that space? Well, in my space, I, I was blessed. My parents, I mean, I, I was really lucky. I had two fantastic parents. Um, believe it or not, my mom and dad together had 11 university degrees. My mother had four and my father had seven. And so when I say had because they both passed away now, but um, they were without question my mentors and my heroes. I did not have to look far. Having said that, you know, there's people like you know, you can, if you're going to talk about the dead, yes, I'll talk about George Washington Carver, Benjamin Banneker, Marie Curry, no doubt about it. If you're talking about living people, you know, um, there's there's Sandra Faber. She's a woman, she's at University of California, Santa Barbara. She's the woman who essentially discovered black holes. I mean, how cool is that on your resume that I discovered what black holes are, right? I mean, so, you know, there's just some amazing people I've been fortunate to come across that are just really neat men and women. You know, being in um, this new role, what have you seen other science museums, what kind of mistakes have you seen them make? Oh, hands down, the fundamental mistake that science museums and frankly, 
other museums are making, and this is not my opinion, this is based on the data, is they still think that the sun rises and sets on the fact that they have a building, right? So we have this beautiful building in the peninsula, 320,000 square feet. We love it, we have great exhibits. We wanna encourage everybody to come as much as possible. But the fact of the matter is museum attendance nationally is on the decline. Museum attendance at science museums is on the decline as well. And so, and one of the reasons why is again, back to these devices, right? Like we have access to instant information through this thing called Google or search engines. And, you know, we talk about a hands-on experience here at COSI, you can get a $2 Google cardboard, download a free app, put your phone in there and get an almost hands-on interactive experience. And so the prospect of still packing that minivan and bringing two or three or four kids to a science museum and spending all day there, while we want you to do it and we'll provide you a great experience, the reality is that's diminishing over time. And so the, one of the big mistakes museum leaders are making is not thinking beyond the walls of their building. And so now there's more and more happening, which is great. Some of my colleagues are doing a fantastic job across the country. One thing that we're really proud of here at COSI is we go beyond the building. We're in the communities where you live, where you learn and where you lounge and will bring science and science-like experiences to you. And it's so important to engage the community in that way because again, science is not about our building. Science is everywhere in society. And so I would say that's the biggest thing that, and again, it's not just science museums, but art museums, you gotta think of how you're relevant in a digital age when you were you know, just relying on foot traffic through your building. Okay, so us being in marketing, Mm -hmm. How do you see this museum? How do you see the relevance versus other museums? Yes. You mean how do I see co-size? Yeah. 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 I mean, so I'll, I'll give you a metaphor. Think of COSI as an experience, right? So right now when I moved here, um, you know, you say COSI. Oh, I remember the old COSI, you know, it was on Broad Street across the original Wendy's. And now you got the new COSI. It's on, okay. Right. When you think COSI, you think of the building. But imagine we could convince society, Central Ohio, Ohio, the nation, if you will, that COSI wasn't a building, but COSI was an experience. And it was then what was so what's that experience? That experience, some type of science experience, interactive, fun, something that they said, wow, that's a science experience or an engineering or a STEM or a STEAM experience. And it was brought to me by this construct called COSI. But you know what? I never even went to the building. So it's our, our, our website. How do we activate our website and make it super engaging that people really want to go there? How, again, are you doing experiences in restaurants, in bars, in hotels, in churches, in synagogues, in playgrounds? How are you out there in the community? How are you at Ohio State Stadium? You know, how are you at the Blue Jackets game? How are you all these play, places giving science experiences that are building independent? And so the more you can do that, the more people can think like, wow, I just had a COSI experience. And then kind of like Google, has become, and I'm not that ambitious, don't get me wrong, but kind of like Google has become synonymous with searching, right? People say, Google it. I mean, how did that become a verb, right? Well, it did become a verb. Well, let's cosify it. You know, let's have that cosi experience. So how does it manifest? It manifests by really providing real experiences all over the place where people are interacting and doing their daily stuff. Understood. So the next exhibit that's coming out, which you had put in the background right there, right? Do you want to kind of explain that and how do you think that's going to really generate a lot more attendance and uh, revenue for the museum? Well, thank you for asking about the 800 pound gorilla in the room. That is Marvel <laughs> in the universe of superheroes. And um, as you mentioned, it's coming to Coastside. It's coming to Coastside Thanksgiving weekend, November 26th through Memorial Day weekend, March, uh, sorry, May 30th of 2022. What is it? Well, we all know about the comic strip Marvels. And then we, of course, know about the amazing movies, which, by the way, no movies have done as well as the blockbuster movies from Marvel. Well, the third leg in that three-legged stool is this hands-on interactive experience. And so the people that made Marvel and then two of the museums combined to create this exhibition, it's 80 years in the making, literally, because Marvel's 80 years old. And that's so important because your question about audiences and new audiences, everybody can relate to some Marvel character. Your grandparents, your parents, and the newest kiddos coming out the womb are already connected to some kind of Marvel character. And so that excites us. The other reason that excites us about having this now is the cool thing about Marvel versus other superheroes, and I, I'm not throwing shade on any other superheroes, I like Superman too, but Superman's from another planet, right, Krypton. 
And the cool thing about the Marvel superheroes is they're all humans like me and you with our faults, with our discrepancies, with issues. And then, oh, they have this really cool superpower. But they're human. They're relatable, right? They struggle with the same struggles. And if you think about what we went through, the last, or still going through, frankly, over the last few years, it's those men and women heroes in our communities, the first responders, doctors, nurses, teachers, right? You can name the whole list. People like you who are marketing, marketing and communicating good positive messages. These are the heroes that kept us sane, if you will, and kept us able to get through. So not only are we getting this amazing super exhibit, we're getting it on a kind of backdrop of it's been really challenging for people. And when things are challenging, you want to look for a hero or a heroine. You know, people like to latch onto that. So we think the timing of it couldn't be better. And, and then the last thing I'll say about it is, you know, just like I referenced earlier, this whole diversity, equity, and inclusion movement, you know, civil rights in the 60s, 50s, and 60s, fast forward, and now we're back to the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter and all these things, social justice. Well, the cool thing about Marvel is Marvel was ahead of its time. Like its characters, they have women from the very beginning superheroes. They have black and brown persons. They have disabled persons. And that's really cool. You think of the X-Men. It's like a collective of people who technically are from the differently abled community, but they're getting together to help make the world a better place. And so all these things have us super excited at Coastside that we're bringing Marvel. We know foot traffic's going to be great, but we promise to keep the light on and door open for you for when you want to come through. You're kind of the superhero of the museum. I don't know about that. I'm just so thrilled to work with my terrific team we have here that's, as you can tell, pretty passionate about what's happening in the science and, and engineering field. Um, but Marvel's the icing on the cake. So when it's all said and done and you've had all these experiences with your career, what kind of legacy do you want to leave? You know, that's a tough question because I don't view myself as at all in the space of even having a legacy. So I, I'm I'm honored and humbled that you would, you would ask that. But I just, you know, like I think of like, people like my parents' age and that kind of stuff, if they were so lucky to have that. And so I don't think about some of that. But if you're asking me what impact would I like to, to, to leave, if I could control that, it would be that people who go through a COSI experience or people who go through, go through a QED with Dr. B experience or Dr. B and 3 experience, that they feel more comfortable about wanting to be curious about science. You know, so that they, that they're less scared of it. I mean, the pandemic is a perfect example. I mean, there's so much rhetoric and so many people are scared and disconnected from science. I would just love for people to, in the same way you're supposed to read and write, in the same way that if you can't read and write and you're illiterate, you know, your parents feel bad for you or you felt bad for your uncle, whoever it is, or society kind of, you know, no, one's, no one feels good about that if someone can't read or write. Well, I would love for that to be true for science as well. And I want to be clear here. I am not talking about making everybody like Miss America is going to have a PhD in, in pharmacology. I'm not talking about making PhD scientists. I'm just saying that if people could feel more comfortable with science and the science process of just asking questions, collecting information, drawing conclusions from that information, and consistently reiterating, I would be super happy. That, that I would be honored. If, if, if I played any small role in that moving the needle, I'd be grateful. So with the DNI movement, there's a lot of younger people interested in the science space. Yeah. How can some of those new students who want to pursue that career overcome some of the obstacles? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, basic things like don't tell anybody, don't, don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. That's the first thing. Um, but um, that, that's an easy thing to say. The hard thing is seek people out. You know, the good news is there are people at every campus, every camp, every in this country, every university campus, college campus, there's always somebody from a diverse background who's in science. Now, you may not have, you know, if you have 100 engineer professors, you're not going to have 90 female, but you'll have 30, you know? Um, same thing, if you have, a, you know, 50 bioscience, you know, um, as a scientist in, in your university, you're not going to have 45 of those 50 be African-American, but you'll have five, right? They exist, and they are so excited when a young person says, hey, you know, I'm interested in blah, 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 Tell me about your experience as a person of color, um, as a diverse individual, and how can you know you may be able to mentor me to help me get through my undergrad and then future um, grad school career and science career. So, so really seeking out. I don't want to use the word unicorns because that implies that they're 
you know, one per trillion. Like seek them out. They are in, if you're, if you're a college student, they're there. If you're a high school student, they might have it in your high school, but if not, they'll go to your neighborhood college or go to your regional college. There are professors there. And again, I have not met an adult professor who is not super thrilled to mentor a young person as in general, by the way, in general, but especially if it's from a diversity and inclusive lens, you'll have so many resources to pull from. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming on to our, our podcast and interviewing you. And you've had some really great insights. And I look forward to seeing the Marvel exhibit and watching you on TV. So thank you so much. Michelle, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Let me know when I can be back. If you're stuck and you can't find the guest, I'm happy to fill it in. I love that. Thank you. If you're interested in learning more, visit our website at bakercreative.co.